Jesus, our Savior. I believe in God, our Father. I believe in Christ, the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. basically what it talks about is God has done so much for us that if, if we if we believe in him we have faith in him like we are we already know some of it right there's some things that we know is just like okay God we we know that you did that and that would be enough the things that he's already done for us sent his son to die for us covered our sins but he's still got more for us he's still got more that's coming our way and so this song says For all that we have seen, we ain't seen nothing. For all the miracles, there's still more coming. New mercies are showing up morning by morning. And God, there's nothing left to prove. So uh, I'm gonna invite you guys to just spread out around the room. It's gonna be kind of chill version of this song, like no drums, we're just gonna have the pad and just the rest of the band.
But if this song reigns true for you, that God, we can see all the good that you're doing, then praise God, that's awesome. And if this song like doesn't make sense to you and you're like, I don't see the good things that God is doing, that's okay too. But bring that to this, bring that here to, to, the, to his presence, bring that to his community, talk about it. Talk about it in your small groups, talk about it with somebody right now. If you need to talk to somebody right now during this song about God, go do it. If there's someone that God lays on your heart right now during this song, go pray for them, go talk to them. See how God can move in their life right now through you. All right, and then, uh, yeah, we'll get, <laughs> get going after that. I just want to thank you, Jesus. Testimony of your goodness. In the safety of your presence. Tis so sweet. Tis so sweet. To only trust in Jesus. And in the darkness, your overwhelming kindness, it follows me, it follows me, and you're still in the fire, just in case we feel alone.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence in this room, God. Thank you for the things that you do for us that are obvious to us and that we can see them. Thank you for the things that you do for us that we won't know until we're on the other side with you. Thank you for life, God. Thank you for every student in this room that you breathe life into them. Thank you that we carry your image, God. Thank you that you made us to be in community. Help us to love one another well. Help us to love you well, God. God, we love you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, y'all grab a seat. Good evening, city students. How are we doing tonight? Oh, man. That was, that did not sound like you ate nacho cheese, jalapenos, and salsa. City students, how are we doing tonight? It's a fiesta in here. That's better. Not great, but it's better. All right. Hey, uh, we got to get, get right into this because I need to use all of the time that I have uh, this evening for this talk because really, uh, if you've been around the past few weeks, we've been in this series called God Is, right? And we've been looking at really trying to unpack the, really the bigness and the vastness of trying to understand the God that we believe in. Now, there are a lot of you who are new to City Students, and so this was this is such a great time because I know so many of you are trying to figure this out. Like, you don't even know what you believe about God or if, this, if any of this is true, right? And so I love that we're having this conversation right at the beginning of the year for all of us to kind of ponder the reality. Some of us have been doing church our whole life, and yet we don't know God at all. And so week one, Camry was up here kind of setting up this question and this tension that we have to navigate. And then last week, uh, my lovely wife, Alexa, who's wearing a very interesting hat tonight. Where are you, Alexa? Where where are you at? Point. There you are. You took the hat off. Interesting. Uh, she She was up here last week, and she shared where we can find God. That ultimately, it's in Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the scriptures that we, we see God revealed in our life. That God came down in human form. The God of the universe came down in human form to live this life so that he could ultimately, one, experience what we experience and we can have a high priest who understands us, right? We sing that song. Uh, we didn't sing it tonight, but we've sang it before, like, you understand me, God, right? It's because Jesus came down to this earth that God fully understands our experience. He's gone through it and that he defeated sin and death and hell and the cross by going to the cross itself. And that the, ultimately the Holy Spirit rushes in as our close encounter with God. That G- God actually lives inside us when we put our faith in Jesus. Right? And that we have God's word. We can actually look to the words God has spoken. And so tonight, it's kind of building to this crescendo. Tonight, I want you to see the very words, the first time that God articulates who he is and who his character is and how he would define himself. We have all these words on this graphic, right? Some of it might be how we feel about God, and we've kind of crossed some of those out. Some of it might be what is true about God in Scripture. Tonight we're going to see it. Firsthand, what does God say about himself? But before we get there, the question I'm, I'm wanting to ask ourselves, I'm wanting us to ask ourselves, is why God? Why God? And that's kind of two ways you can ask that question. Why would I even believe in God in the first place? And why does God, if he is good and loving and has mercy and is patient and we, call that, we say that he's good and just, why do all these terrible things happen? Why is there evil in the world? Why do I experience suffering? And I got to say this also. Let's just acknowledge something. Every one of you in here has, has experienced some kind of, of hard thing in your life, some kind of difficult challenge, circumstance, suffering. Some of you have faced real, powerful injustice in your life. 
And sometimes when we're young and teenagers in Williamson County, we think everything is terrible when it's actually not, right? Like you ate nachos tonight. Like there are people in the world who are going to bed hungry tonight, right? Like we played games and had fun and danced and we get to come in this building and worship Jesus freely. And some people, that would put them in jail, right? So just recognize, I, I know that I never want to underestimate the pain that's in this room. I know you've navigated hard things. And when we say we're suffering as Christians in America, we got to be careful that we don't, we don't just talk like that all the time. Because the reality is we have it pretty good in a lot of ways. You guys feeling what I'm feeling? Yeah? Okay, great. So... I want to pray, and then we're going to get into this. So, Father, we just invite you into this conversation tonight. We do not want to define you. We want you to define yourself to us. So, God, would you reveal yourself, just like Alexa talked about last week, would you reveal yourself in your son, Jesus, who came to this earth? Will you reveal yourself in in your presence and the fullness of the Spirit of God filling this room right now, moving in our hearts and minds and revealing to us your scriptures? Would you reveal yourself to us in your words? And we just invite you to have your way in this room tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're talking about why God. We believe a lot of things in life, right? We believe, uh, in fact, I need, I need a volunteer real quick. Peyton, you're the first hand I saw, so come on up. Peyton's going to come up. She's going to be my volunteer, all right? You're going to demonstrate some beliefs that we all have in this room tonight. Uh, do you believe in oxygen? Okay, will you show us how you breathe air? Okay, good. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's not how I breathe air. Like, I'm not going like that everywhere I go, but that's this. You do you. Um, okay. Do you believe in gravity? Okay, so stand right here. We're going to test this theory. Gravity. That's how it works, right? Okay, come back up. You're all right, right? Was that assault? I don't know. Um... Do you believe in water? Do you believe that, this, that there's maybe water, a liquid? Do you believe that water is wet? Do you believe if I pour this bottle of water on your head that it will make your head wet? Now you have to, you gotta, you gotta stay the whole time. You put your hand up. All right, so let's test this theory off. Okay, I have the lid off. I tricked you, well, kind of, some drops, some drops. There is water in here, but I taped it, all right? Give it up for Peyton. Good job. Those are like the most basic things I could come up with in my head, right? We have way way more things that maybe are a little bit more outlandish than gravity and oxygen and water that we actually do believe in and put our trust in. More than we might believe in God and trust in God. But we don't question oxygen, and we don't question gravity. We don't question whether there's water in this water bottle. Maybe you do now because I broke your trust. But but we question God all the time. And he's, he's what's revealed in Scripture and, like, the the. The Bible and the Christian faith has withstood the test of time. We're going to talk about that in like a month or so. We're going to talk about the Bible a little bit. But millions of people have believed in the God of the Bible, billions of people, who knows how many, trillions maybe, over time. There are, we have eyewitness accounts of people who saw the resurrected Jesus, and those people throughout their lineage to this day, there's people in Israel whose great ancestors were around when Jesus was around. And they're like, yeah, it was real. And yet, anytime I would argue, maybe when we come into a moment where we have to put our trust in God or we have to maybe step out in and be confident or be bold or be courageous, maybe we have to be obedient to something God says, Maybe we just don't like our state of life, our season of life, and and immediately we just go, God's not good, or he's not real. Because the circumstances I'm in, the discomfort I'm going through, my experience, my limited human experience is defining my reality. And so God obviously must not be good 
or he must not be real. Then you add the layer of evil and suffering and the hardness of the world, tragedy, right? You, you put on the news, and it's just like nonstop cycle of all of these terrible things that are happening in our world, in our country, even in our city, right? And so it's like I get, like, it makes sense that we get there, that we wrestle with this, like, man, if God is good, why do these things happen? Now, there's a story that I think in Scripture really paints this reality so well for us. And I want, I want to just give you some freedom right now that it's okay to have these questions. Right? Everyone look at me real quick. Is, this, is, this is the natural experience of a real Christian navigating suffering and evil and wanting to believe and trust God. Right? You would, you would be like ignorant to not have those two things in your hands and go, I don't know how to deal with both of these at the same time. Like that is the natural experience of a person of faith. And it's a natural, that's a natural experience of a person of any faith. Not just people, not just Christians, but people who believe in the God of the Bible. I'm going to come back around to that in a second. But I want to show you the story of a guy in Scripture that I think really we get to see his experience in the wrestling of those two realities. God is good, and bad things happen, and I don't know how those two things can be true at the same time. So we're going to watch a Bible Project video. If you love those, you're going to love this. If you don't love those, just stick it out for a little bit. Um, But I think this is one of the best ways to just imagine and see, and uh, they'll they'll teach it better than I would. So um, check this out, and then I'll come back up to do some more. There are three books in the Bible known as the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. The first, Proverbs, showed us that God is wise and just. Yeah, we learned that God has ordered the world so that it's fair. The righteous are rewarded, the wicked are punished. In other words, you get what you deserve. But then we meet Ecclesiastes who observes, people don't always get what they deserve. Uh, Yeah, he said the world isn't always fair, that life is unpredictable and hard to comprehend, just like smoke. And this makes you wonder, okay, well, is God wise and just? Exactly. And so it's that question that is being explored in the final book of wisdom, Job. All right, let's dive in. So Job begins with a strange story that takes place up in the heavens, which are described something like a heavenly command center. So God is there with these angelic creatures called the sons of God, and they're all there reporting for duty. And God points out this guy Job, his servant, showing how righteous and good he is. And then one of these angelic creatures approaches. He's referred to in Hebrew as the Satan. The Satan. Who is this? Well, this word is actually a title, which literally means the one who is opposed. So out of this whole crew, he is the one questioning how God is running the world. And he proposes that Job might not actually love God, that he's only a good person because God rewards him. If God were to take away all of the good things he gave to Job, then we would see his true colors. So he thinks Job is just working the system? That's exactly right. Maybe he's obeying just to get what he wants. So God agrees to this experiment and allows the Satan to inflict suffering on Job. And Job loses everyone and everything that he cares about. It is devastating. And remember, he deserves none of this. God himself said so. The remarkable thing is that in the midst of all this suffering, Job still praises God. At least for chapters one and two. But then in chapter three, we find out how he's really feeling inside. He unleashes this poem that reveals his devastation. It's a long, elaborate curse on the day that he was born. After this, some of Job's friends come to visit him to offer their help. And all of them are like, Job, you must have done something horribly wrong to deserve this. After all, we know God is just, and we know the world is ordered by God's justice and fairness, so you must be getting what you deserve. And for the next 34 chapters, the friends and Job go back and forth in very dense Hebrew poetry, 
His friends keep speculating about why God might have sent such suffering, and they even start making up lists of hypothetical sins that Job must have committed. But after each accusation, Job defends his innocence. And Job is innocent. He is. He's also on an emotional roller coaster. At some moments, he's very confident that God is still wise and just. Yeah, in other moments, he's doubting God's goodness. He even comes to accuse God of being reckless, unfair, and corrupt. So by the end of the dialogue, Job demands that God come and explain himself in person. And God does so. He comes in the form of a great storm cloud. Now, God doesn't give Job a direct answer. He doesn't tell Job about the conversation with the Satan. Yeah, he does something very different. He takes Job on a virtual tour of the universe. He shows Job how grand the world is, and he asks him if he's even capable of running it or understanding it just for a day. He shows Job how much detail there is in the world, things that we might see every day but really don't understand at all. But God does. He knows it all intimately. He pays attention to the beauty and operations of the universe in ways that we haven't even imagined and in places that we will never see. Then to conclude, God shows Job two wondrous beasts and brags about how great they are. Yeah, they are dangerous. I mean, they would kill you without even thinking about it. And God says they're not evil. They're actually a part of his good world. And then that's it. That's God's whole defense. It's kind of weird. I mean, what was this all about? It seems to be this. From Job's point of view, it looks like God is not just. But God's perspective is infinitely bigger. He's dynamically interacting with a whole universe of complexity when he makes decisions. And this is what God calls his wisdom. So Job asking God to defend himself is actually kind of absurd. He couldn't comprehend this kind of complexity even if he wanted to. So where does this leave us? Well, it leaves Job in a place of humility. He never learned why he suffered, and yet he's able to live in peace and in the fear of the Lord. But that's not where the book ends, because after this, God restores to Job double everything he had lost. And this, again, is surprising. I mean, is this a reward? Is God saying, congratulations, Job, you passed this elaborate test? No. I mean, the whole book just made the point that Job losing everything was not a punishment. And so now getting it back isn't a reward. So why does he get it back? Well, apparently, God, in his wisdom, decided to give Job a gift. We don't know why. But what we do know is that Job is now the kind of person who, no matter what comes, good or bad, he can trust God's wisdom. And that's the book of Job and the end of our wisdom series. These biblical books of wisdom are amazing. Each one offers a unique perspective on the good life, and you need to hear all of them together as you learn to live with wisdom and in the fear of the Lord. All right. So, that's good. Thank you. I love the way that that video ends. And if you're kind of like, man, the way they drew God was interesting, and there's those beasts, and it's like all this stuff. It's like, don't get hung up on that stuff, right? I wanted you to see the, the visual and the artistic expression of that's what we go through. Now, maybe you haven't experienced suffering like Job has, right? And it's probably some of the most severe kind of suffering, to lose everything. Maybe you have. His, his journey is one where he's like struggling to trust God and then even curse that he was born and, and then demand an answer from God. And God in his, in his kindness actually gives not the answer Job wanted, but he showed up in his life. And he gave him something that brought him closer to God and made him more humble and wise. You know, I, I heard to, as I was putting this together, that pain and suffering will either make you bitter or it'll make you better. What if we took the hardest moments of our life 
allowed the, the weight and the challenge and the, the struggle of him to wrestle with God, probably not getting the answer we want. In fact, if you're asking yourself a why question right now, I can almost guarantee you, you probably won't get the answer. But maybe in the search of the why, you find the who. You find the one who does have all the answers and wants to shape us and mold us so that we can trust him with all of this. I want to put up one slide real quick, and then I'm going to switch gears to the next part where we actually unpack how God defines himself. But just some realities that I, we, need to, we need to recognize and we need to, we need to journey. And the first is that God is sovereign, which means that he is in control of all things. Nothing happens outside of God's purview. Everything, I heard Shannon say this once, everything is sifted through God's hands, the good and the bad. Which means there's just something, this is really hard. I struggle with this. God allows evil and suffering. He allows it. And the, lots of different people will try to give you an answer as to why. There are different rules of, and schools of faith and theology that would try to answer that question. For me, I don't need to know why. Because in the, in the wondering, in the questioning, in the struggle, it brings me closer to God. Because the reality is the rest of those things are true as well, is that God is good and just, which we're going to talk about right now. And that we know Revelation, Isaiah, Jesus himself, in multiple places in the Bible, it tells us that evil has been defeated and one day will be no more. Pain and suffering will no longer exist once heaven invades earth fully and Jesus returns. It's the hope we have for a greater day. But until then, we live the life of Job and we wrestle. But one thing that can give us the most confidence, the most secure foundation that we can live our lives on is figuring out exactly who God is. And this is what he says of himself. If you'll turn to... Exodus chapter 34. This is going to be our main text for tonight. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. My version might be a little bit different than yours, so it will be on the screens, but follow along. I, before I uh, read it, I, I want to just give you the context that this is the most quoted section of the Old Testament. So um, I was trying to think of different like phrases like, um, what's McDonald's? Like theme. What's the thing they say? I'm loving it, right? What's Nike? Just do it. Okay, what's like one more? Finger looking good. Finger looking good. Okay, what's Arby's? We have the meats, right? Okay, so hold on, hold on. Shh, don't go far from that. Shh, hold on. Okay, so those are, those are things that you immediately equate with those places, right? Right? Uh, the iPhone 15 just got shown, right? So like when you see an iPhone, you think of Apple, right? Okay. This part of scripture is the essence of the people of God. It is the thing that they would quote and refer back to and build all of their faith upon because this is the first time that God describes himself. And it's, it's quoted, I think, over 20 times in the Bible, and it's the most quoted piece of Scripture from the Old Testament. It's a big deal. It's essential. Just like how Jesus quotes the Shema, this would be just like on par with that. If you think of the United States of America, we have the Declaration of, Ind of Independence, and then we have the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, like those major documents that define our country. This would be the thing that defines the people of Israel. And it would be the thing that defines us because it defines God. So let's read it with that in mind. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. He maintains loyal love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, 
transgression and sin. All three of those are, are different words to kind of describe different types of sins and different ways we sin. And the reason that's there is really just to define for us in kind of a simple way, everything that we think of as sin, yeah, that's what God's forgiving right now, right? Yet he won't declare innocent the guilty. He will bring the iniquities of the fathers upon the children and grandchildren to the third and the fourth generation is basically what that means. So five words that God uses to describe himself. I want to show you these. But then that last little part is, is kind of like maybe when you read that, you're like, what? <laughs> All the sweet things over here. And then we're like, God's punishing grandchildren? Like, what's going on over here? I'm going to unpack that, okay? So let's do this real quick. The first one is compassion, compassionate, right? Like God is compassionate. It is uh, the Hebrew word rachma or rachamim, which is basically the picture of, it's actually used in different parts of the Bible to describe a womb. So the picture for us is the way a mother relates to a child, to an infant, to a baby. Like the, the, the tenderness, the closeness, the, the way that a mother would protect their child. I wasn't planning on sharing this story. One time, Alexa, if you didn't want me to share this, I'm sorry. Uh, one time, we were going somewhere to get pictures taken for Luke, and it was with Santa, and the way they had it set up was whack. Like, why would you even do it this way? But you would go with your kids up the stairs in this, like, kind of house building thing, and you'd go up the stairs, you take a picture with Santa, and you go down the stairs. So we go do that, we're going down, and I'm like, Alexa, do you want me to carry Luke down the stairs? She's like, no, I got it. First step, we're good. Second step, Alexa proceeds to fall down the stairs with Luke in her arms. And I just, like, whenever I'm in a moment like this, I just freeze. I don't know what to do. I'm just so shocked, and I'm like, ah! I was just, like, standing there. She, like, football carried that boy, like, wrapped him up and destroyed everything about herself, like, tumbling <laughs> down the stairs. But she took care of our son. And if he's a little weird, it might be because of that, but... He's amazing. Like, that's the idea of compassionate. The way a mother would protect, protect their child is the way that God feels towards us. It's a feeling and an action. That God feels tenderness towards you. God likes you. God wants to be near you. He wants to take care of you, and he will. He's going to move in compassion on our behalf. God is compassionate, deeply moved. Next word is gracious. Gracious. This is the idea of grace or favor. The idea of a gift given in delight. Showing favor to those who should get what they deserve. Unmerited. You didn't do anything to earn this. God just bestows a gift. Right? The end of the Job video. Like, we think, and this is why this question comes up, like, why do good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people? First off, that's not biblically correct. No one on this planet is good. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I have, you have, your mom has, your dad has, your grandpa has, your grandma, every one of us. In our humanness, there's nothing good about us. And so the end of Job's story, God just bestows grace upon him. Not because Job did anything impressive, but because God is gracious. Unearned, unmerited favor from God. The next one is slow to anger. Slow to anger. The, the Hebrew word is, is actually... Long of nose, which is weird. But the way that they would describe anger back then was like if your nose got all red. So have you ever seen someone really angry and their face just gets red right here, right? That, that was like their picture for anger back then. But they, they've never seen God physically. They've never seen him like physically manifest. So they don't even know, does God have a nose? I don't know. Like, so they would, they would use this to describe him. 
And the idea that he would have a long nose means that he would, he, it would take him a really long time to get angry. That God is patient with us. So his anger, he does get angry. It's an expression of his justice at wrongdoing. Right? The, the, just this week, I was giving my sons a bath, and L- Luke, I don't know, this might be weird, I don't know. My boys, I do, we do bath time, they do baths together. If you do that growing up or you didn't do that growing up, whatever, that's just where we're at right now. So it, it, it's a lot faster. So uh, they're playing in the bath, and then Luke stands up, and Ben's got his leg like this, and Luke goes to like full weight step on Ben's leg. And I'm I, like, I know if he continues, that leg is going to break. So I move, I, I get right in his face, and I, I get serious, and I say, don't ever do that again. And I, and I was serious with him because I'm protecting my other one, right? Because I care about both of them. I don't want him to break his leg, and I don't want him to have a broken leg, right? If your parents have ever, you run out to the street, and they grab you and yank you, they're like, why you do it's because they love you and they care about you. you. You get mad because your parents put restrictions on you or they, they don't give you a cell phone yet or they give you a curfew or they do all these things and you're like, why are you trying to control me? Why are you trying to mess up my life? No, dude, they're trying to protect you because they love you and they care about you. Now, some of your parents might be a little crazy, but most of them, it's, it's good, like 95%. God is slow to anger. I mean, just think about it all, just for a second. If you messed up once, if God was not slow to anger and you messed up one time, right, you'd be done. Do we, do we want God to just annihilate people if they mess up one time? Because there would be no humans on the planet. God is slow to anger. He gives us Thousands on thousands on thousands of chances. I just think of Pharaoh in Egypt. How many plagues did Moses send to Pharaoh in Egypt? Ten. Ten plagues. Each one was an opportunity for Pharaoh to choose a different path. And he didn't. God does not want to punish people. He wants to save people. He wants to forgive people. He wants to redeem people. And sin has consequences. And there is justice. Thank God there's justice in our world. Can you imagine a world where there weren't consequences for wrongdoing? God is not content to let us sit in our own self-destruction. He wants to save us and help us. Not make the worst choices in our life. The last one, or no, the fourth one, sorry. The fourth one is loyal love. Loyal love. This is the idea of generous, loving, enduring commitment. Promise keeping to us. Unconditional promise keeping. Even if we break the promise, God does not. He is a covenant keeper. God keeps his promise all the way to becoming human to this earth. And we talked about that earlier. It's not based on something someone does. It's just the, in the character of a person that has this kind of loyal love. They just keep their commitments. They keep their promises. That's the idea of God. It's not based on what we've done. We don't earn a promise. We don't earn the favor. He just keeps it because that's who he is. He remains true. Which is our last one, faithfulness. Faithfulness is the idea of, it's actually kind of is where we get the word amen from. Amen is like, no, that's true, right? When Pastor Tony's teaching on Sunday and he's like, come on, can I get an amen? He wa- he's wanting us to respond back to him and say, yes, that's true. I believe that. Which you can totally do that if I'm teaching here on Wednesday nights. Just throw that out there. Thank you. There you go. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Never mind. Never mind. You guys, you guys too much. This is the idea. This is the idea that, it, that God is truth. That he is true. That he is the correct ideas. That he is stable and reliable and st- steady. That we can believe in him. That he is going to come through. 
that we can trust him. God has been faithful all along. And these characteristics, that God is compassionate, that he's gracious, that he's slow to anger, that he's, he has loyal love for us, that he has faithfulness, all of these are embodied in the person of Jesus. Jesus represents these, and he takes them all the way. He reveals them to be absolutely true, that he goes to the cross all the way. In Romans 5, it puts it this way. I'm going to read two different versions just for you to see this. Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Just This isn't, I wrote this really fast, so I don't think it's grammatically correct, but I'm just taking that word love and throwing in all of the Hebrew words that we just went over, the words from Exodus to define that one word love to describe the character of God. This is how it reads. But God shows his compassion and grace, his slowness to anger, that he's overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is our God. This is who we put our trust in. This is who we believe in. And even in the hardness of life, the sufferings, even when we don't have all the answers to all the questions, we can trust that this is who God is, that Jesus embodied it, and that his spirit lives inside us. When we put our faith in Jesus, his spirit lives inside us to bring these things into every part and every space of our life. Now, two minutes on that last part. What about the iniquities and the generations and all that stuff? Like, if you've heard me mention this, I'm just going to throw a couple things up here. Sin has consequences. I am a child of divorce, meaning my parents were divorced. Both my parents, their parents were divorced. And I'm pretty sure their parents were also divorced. I think one of my great-grandparents, their husband died and she remarried. But like my heritage, my history, my legacy is divorce. You think that doesn't have consequences on my life as a person? I don't even know how to be married because I've never seen it. Sorry, Alexa, we're figuring this out, right? Most of my life, until I was probably 21, 23, my dad was high. Most of my life, most of my childhood. And I love him, and I've forgiven him, and we've, we're making progress in our relationship. But if you think that I don't have consequences because of the sins of my father, I totally do. And I'm watching my sons reap the consequences of my own sins. And a lot of times I'm like, yeah, I'm that, he's going to go to counseling for that. Like, but in, in all seriousness, like, I just want you to hear this. This is not condemnation. This is not me looking down on you. Any of that. If you could just look at me for a second, because you need to hear this. There's, there's a few of you in here tonight. You're not even sure about the city students thing. You don't know about this Jesus thing. You don't know anything. But I just want you to hear this. I want you to look me in the eyes. Focus for this. Put your phone down for a second because if you hear anything, I actually want it to be this. Sin is going to wreck your life. And the thing that you think is hidden and secret and no one knows about and the thing I, I do on Friday nights and the thing we're, me and this girl over here, this guy over here are doing or the thing I look at or the way I talk about this person, if you think no one knows, if you think your parents don't see it in how it's changing you, if you think that it doesn't have consequences, please, 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 here, my love for you, sin is going to wreck your life. But there is a God who is just and good who has compassion and mercy, who's slow to anger. He has loyal love and faithfulness for you, and he has chances on chances on chances and grace upon grace upon grace. If you would turn to him and say yes to Jesus. That whole line about the third and fourth generation and, and the 
the sin passing down to those further ones, it's, it's really simple. It's again, sin has consequences. Someone is going to deal with that. Someone's going to be impacted by that. But what, what did you also catch in the beginning of Exodus? Just read it real quick. If we can throw it back up there. Thank you. He maintains loyal love for thousands. So which is it? The third or fourth generation or thousands of generations? Which one is more? Three to four or thousands? In James it says, mercy triumphs over judgment. I didn't believe that at a point in my life. Until I saw that that was the very character of God. I thought everyone deserved judgment. I thought people should be punished harsher. And then I saw that God's mercy was on my life. And mercy triumphs over judgment. There's consequences to sin. God is just, and he's going to bring justice to the world. But mercy will always triumph over judgment. God is faithful. He has loyal love. He is gracious and true. And he loves us. He's compassionate. And he has mercy and grace for us. And that's who he is. And if we would turn to him, even in the hardness of life and in the circumstances and the evil and the suffering that we go through, we would find that he is true. I want to read this quote and then I'm, we're going to pray and be done. Timothy Keller, he passed away recently. He's one of my favorite people. He says this, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted We are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. My prayer for us tonight is that that would just ring true for so many of us. And the hardness of life and the challenge and the suffering and the evil we see, maybe there's an injustice you're going through right now. I pray that in the wrestling with that reality that you would see that God is trustworthy and true, that he has unfailing, unconditional love and grace for you, embodied in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And that you would turn to him. Even in the wrestling, in your whys and your questions, you would look to the who. Not getting the answer you wanted, but the one you needed. Jesus, have your way in the rest of tonight. We give it to you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.